undergraduate at the University of Michigan um, and he did his uh, PhD work at University of Hawaii um, and uh, he uh, is a coronagraph and high resolution spectroscopy specialist and he's going to talk to us today about his work uh, on exoplanets and specifically using Hubble to uh, look at formal hearts. So thanks very much Paul. Thank you very much Adrian. Uh, it's great to be here. I uh, just started working here over the summer uh, so it's a pleasure to have a chance to give you uh, a talk about my research. Um, this is a very current uh, topic. Uh, the discovery was made about uh, a year ago uh, and published uh, last November. You can find the, uh, the papers in Science, uh, uh, the main paper, Optical Images of an Exosolar Planet 25 Light Years from Earth. Uh, and also a companion paper by another Berkeley uh, faculty member, uh, Eugene Chang, who did the theoretical aspect of, uh, of this discovery. Also, I have very many uh, great collaborators in Berkeley at NASA, Goddard, and uh, JPL, and other places throughout the world that were uh, 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 part of this project and continue to work on this project. So this is uh, the story I'm going to talk about today. It's uh, this uh, image that uh, made the headlines uh, back in November. And uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, uh, you'll have a good idea of how did we get to this point where all of a sudden we were able to image uh, an extrasolar planet around another nearby star. Now, it's an old story, though. I mean, if you think back to your intro astronomy books, you probably learned that Democritus, uh, who was a philosopher, uh, speculated about uh, innumerable worlds of different sizes uh, in the universe. And Epicurus, for example, a couple hundred years later, talked about there are infinite worlds, both unlike this world of ours and like our world of ours. Not necessarily with living creatures and plants, but possibly so. And of course, uh, as science, uh, the scientific method was developed, uh, first uh, essentially by Islamic scholars and then by uh, Western European scholars, Copernicus understood that the, uh, <coughs> that the uh, planets go around the sun. Uh, and uh, Kepler, of course, uh, gave us the law of planetary orbits. Uh, and this is something that you're going to see again later in the talk. Notice how a planetary orbit, according to Kepler, uh, has an elliptical shape where the star is at one focus of the ellipse, and it's not at the center of this orbit. Galileo, uh, of course, was the first to begin uh, studying the planets in our own solar system in uh, uh, better and better detail. And that's a story uh, familiar to uh, most of you uh, here. So you can start uh, looking at the known contents of our own solar system without knowing anything else about solar systems uh, around other stars. Uh, you know that the, you have the, the star in the center. You have the planets, the terrestrial planets, the gas giant planets. You have ring systems around uh, these planets satellites, uh, uh, moons of these planets, many thousands of asteroids, and out, out beyond the orbit of Neptune, or just at the orbit of Neptune, you have this belt of icy objects call, called the Kuiper Belt, uh, a source of uh, comets and uh, something that was discovered in the 90s. And farther out still, you have the Oort Cloud, uh, um, of comets, and in between all of this uh, are dust grains. Uh, dust grains produced uh, by collisions among uh, these icy bodies and uh, by cometary activity. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So as a scientist, uh, as you uh, begin to understand the solar system in uh, 
greater detail, you realize that the orbits of the planets are coplanar roughly, uh, nearly circular and roughly with a prograde uh, direction. And also the planetary spins are mostly prograde. So even though we can't observe the origin of the solar system, we can pretty much understand how it came about. That uh, in the early solar system, uh, a cloud of gas and dust collapsed to form our sun. But there was a disk also uh, made of gas and dust from which the planets formed. We call it a circumstellar disk, a disk around a star. Uh, some of it was rocky, and you can make the terrestrial plants out of it. Uh, other was uh, volatile, so you have the uh, gas giants farther out beyond the ice line. And we know when we look at other stars uh, in the galaxy that have these disks, that planet formation uh, occurs uh, ra rapidly. It, uh, it takes no more than 10 million years to produce a planetary system. But the question is, given that we know uh, what the solar system is made of, its characteristics, uh, and uh, we have a good theory of how the planets came about, how they were uh, uh, constructed. What do we know about planetary systems around other stars in the galaxy? So when I was a student, I was a student at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor as an undergrad, I asked my supervisor, Doug Richstone. Doug Richstone uh, is a famous astronomer who uh, discovered uh, black holes. And uh, back in 1988, that's when I was a student at uh, U of M. And his answer was to my question, are there planets around other stars? His answer was, no. We have no evidence for extrasolar planets. This is back in 1988. And therefore, you have to conclude that even though you have a reasonable theory, uh, you really need testable observations to understand if there are planets around other stars. But he was half wrong, I would say. Because four years earlier, there was a very important discovery in 1984. And this was actually advertised by uh, Carl Sagan uh, in Parade Magazine. And this is uh, in 1984, uh, when I was in high school, actually. And I think it's appropriate that I uh, read some of his words here. This is how it starts. Our lovely world, the Earth, with its core, mantle, crust, and atmosphere, mountain tops and ocean basins, and its cargo of microbes, plants, animals, and humans, circles the sun once a year. Eight other planets also orbit the sun in roughly the same plane, as well as dozens of moons, thousands of asteroids, trillions of comets, and innumerable particles of fine debris. So uh, what was he talking about, uh, the innumerable particles of fine debris? Well, that's our zodiacal light. Here's a picture I took uh, from the south of Spain. All of this dust is the debris that orbits uh, in our solar system. Uh, and it's roughly essentially due to the collisions and the sublimation of dust off of uh, cometary objects. Here's comet Hale-Bopp. And this was something that has been observed for uh, uh, over a century. Uh, uh, here is a quote uh, that was published in monthly notices from 1859, describing the shape of the zodi zodiacal dust. Now, <coughs> what Carl Sagan is referring to is not our own zodiacal dust. In this illustration, what the artist is trying to depict is the discovery of dust around other stars, Vega in particular. <coughs> And this was accomplished by the IRAS mission, which was an infrared uh, satellite. Uh, it surveyed the entire sky at 12, 25, 60, and 100 microns. Uh, for reference, this is what a cat looks like at these uh, wavelengths, uh, completely different from optical wavelengths. And when IRAS looked at stars, this is the spectrum we expected. Uh, this is black body radiation uh, from stars. Here is the visible part of the spectrum. Uh, light uh, from our sun peaks in the visible, and then there's something called a Rayleigh genes tail that declines roughly as a straight line on a plot like this. So when IRAS looked at Vega, what we expected is a straight line at these wavelengths. This is 10 microns here, 
and this is 100 microns here. So IRAS was looking at this part of the spectrum. But this is what was observed. Here is that Rayleigh genes tail as a function of wavelength. Here's 12, 25, 60, and 100 microns. This is uh, flux density and Jansky. And this is what was expected. And here are the data points right there. They're uh, anomalous, much higher than what was expected, an order of magnitude higher. And in fact, when Vega was first observed, they thought the instrument uh, was broken because no one expected numbers uh, this high. Here's another star, Fomalhaut, that uh, is the subject of this talk, and Beta Pick. Be uh, Dana Backman, who's a PI here, uh, uh, back in 1993, called these three stars the big three in terms of something called the Vega phenomena. The phenomena of having excess infrared emission. And what was understood is that this infrared emission is due to dust uh, reprocessing uh, light from uh, reprocessing radiation from the star. So our own zodiacal uh, dust here is seen in the optical, but if you were to uh, be uh, away from the sun looking down on our solar system, all of this dust would glow in the infrared. And that's what was observed uh, and discovered by IRAS. Now, if you think about stars with dust around them, for example, think about the Pleiades. The Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, is a beautiful nebulosity also surrounded by dust. But it doesn't look like a planetary system. The dust is called interstellar dust, and it surrounds the star. So it's not necessarily related <coughs> to planets. So the question with uh, this discovery of dust around Vega, Fomalhaut, and Beta Pic was, is this dust that we see here in the infrared uh, uh, somewhat like the Pleiades, interstellar in origin? Or is it related to, uh, to planet formation, like our own zodiacal dust disk? So to answer that question, we need imaging. And this was the first image obtained of uh, one of these Vega phenomena stars. It's the Beta Pic uh, dust disk by Smith and Terrell back in 1984. This is a CCD image uh, in the optical. The star is being artificially <coughs> eclipsed by a coronagraph. So we don't see the star in this image. The light from the star has been blocked out. And when you do that, what's revealed is this nebulosity which uh, resembles an edge on solar system. Uh, you don't see the planets, but what you see is this dust uh, that produces this excess thermal emission. And what people quickly understood is that the dust itself could be a clue to the existence of planets in the system. Essentially, uh, due to the gravitational perturbations of a planet, these are all theoretical simulations, Dust around a star can be modified in its spatial distribution. For example, uh, a planet here can clear out the central region of a dust disk so that there's a hole in the dust distribution. You can't quite see it here in Beta Pix, uh, 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 in this picture of Beta Pix dust disk, but essentially there's a hole in the dust distribution which indicates that Beta Pix may have a planetary system. There are other asymmetries that you can look for. Uh, for example, you can have this clumpy structure. This is actually a simulation of the sun and the earth. Our zodiacal dust disk is enhanced in density by 10% in a direction trailing the earth due to orbital dynamics. You can create these holes, and you can also create vertical asymmetries in the dust. So if you look at uh, uh, stars such as Vega and Epsilon Eridani, um, here are observations of the dust emission that were resolved later at 150 microns. Uh, and you can see that the dust distribution in the data is very clumpy, not smooth at all. Here is the star, but the, concent the biggest concentration of dust around Vega is 80 astronomical units from the star to the northeast. And these are simulations where a planet is inserted into a model of a dust disk. And due to uh, resonance dynamics, you can produce clumpy structure. So uh, there is uh, this tantalizing evidence that these stars have uh, planets around them. Here is a simulation now in, uh, in, uh, 
where you have a planet here clearing out dust and producing uh, resonance features where this is supposed to represent a simulation of Vega. Okay, so the dust gives us a clue that these stars have planets. Can you, find, can you directly detect these planets? For many of these stars, the answer is uh, hopeful because the, the stars we're talking about are young. Here is the sun, uh, the age of the sun. Here is uh, dustiness, actually. And you can see that dust declines as a function of age. So that, in fact, some of these objects that were discovered by IRAS are dusty because they're young. So here's Beta Pic, for example. And here's Fomalhaut, also called Alpha PSA, and Alpha Lyra, or Vega, and Epsilon Eri. All of these stars are young. Uh, and that means that the planets may still be glowing uh, in the infrared, because the planets are relatively young. Young planets are still releasing their heat of formation. So that if you look at the theoretical apparent magnitude of planets around these stars at 0.8 microns, which is still visible, uh, you can look at these three stars here. Here are the ages. Here's how far they are. They're ages 200 million years old, 200 million years old. And Beta Pic is the youngest here at 10 million years of age. The stars are quite bright. But here is the apparent magnitude of uh, a 1 Jupiter mass planet and a 10 Jupiter mass planet around these stars. So if you know about how sensitive our telescopes are, this is not too difficult to achieve. We can easily detect a 20 second magnitude object in the sky. But the problem is the star. The stars are too bright. Vega is, all of these are uh, naked eye stars. You can go out uh, tonight and uh, uh, see Vega, I believe. Uh, and Fomalhaut also, very low in the south. It's a first magnitude star. So when you have a bright star next to a faint target, the, the problem becomes very difficult. In fact, this is why direct imaging of planets has been one of the last methods of planet detection, extrasolar planet detection, to succeed. So the, w when you look at an image of, for example, Beta Pic here, you can see various artifacts. See this dark ring in the image? That's an artifact of trying to remove light from the, uh, the stellar light, the stellar contribution. So it distorts the image of the disk. So in fact, this little uh, dent in the disk morphology is artificial. It's not real. So one of the problems is understanding what things in your image are real and not artifacts. Once you'd establish what uh, things are real, for example, look at how beta pix, uh, this side of beta pix disk is longer than this side. This is actually a real uh, morphology. It's not an artifact. So once you establish that's real, how do you know it's due to planets? And you don't know immediately. You can't assume that these asymmetries are due to planets. For example, here is the, uh, the belt-like disk around HR4796A. Uh, it's a southern star. And you would think that this star definitely has a planetary system uh, within the boundary of the belt. But look at this model here, also of dust. Uh, this disk, the circumstellar disk of dust, also forms a ring because if you add a little gas into this system, the gas uh, changes the dynamics of the dust. And you can produce ring-like features with no planetary system. So these are the two things we have to consider. Uh, what is real and what is due to a planet once you find what's real. So let's talk about Fomalhaut. Why search for a planet around Fomalhaut? Well, we have these dust grains, and that is an indication that the planet formation process occurred around this star. It's nearby and a high, has a high proper motion. That means the star is moving rapidly in the sky, which means that if there are any objects moving with the star, any, any planets associated with the star, you can see the star and planet moving against the background of stars. So you can immediately identify uh, objects that are physically related to the star. 
It's also young. Uh, so if you remember from that plot, uh, these young stars uh, equal bright planets uh, in the infrared. Um, so these self-luminous planets are possibly detectable. So here are some first attempts to find a planet around uh, Fomalhaut. I, uh, I did my PhD thesis at the University of Hawaii using a chronograph. So I was at 14,000 feet on Mauna Kea using a chronograph to look for uh, the dust around Fomalhaut, and I see nothing. Even though actually this ring of dust around Fomalhaut is located here, I haven't done a good enough job of subtracting light from the star, even though I'm using a chronograph. The fidelity of this image isn't sufficient to detect the dust belt around Fomalhaut or any planetary companions. So that was me from the ground. This is using Hubble. Uh, six years later, Al Schultz uh, made an attempt to uh, find planets around Fomalhaut using the Whitefield Planetary Camera 2. Uh, and here is the image you have. And look at how terribly the light is subtracted from the star. There's no way that you could detect a planetary system around a formal hut. What was successful was the infrared, I mean the submillimeter at 450 and 850 microns. These are images of Fomalhaut obtained at these wavelengths. So what you saw is emission on either side of the star, which indicated that Fomalhaut's dust disk was actually a belt of material. And this was uh, also seen by the Spitzer Space Telescope, uh, which is still orbiting the Earth. Here is an image of Fomalhaut at 70 microns. And you can see that there are two clumps of emission on either side of the star. Now, uh, the question is, uh, how do we do this? How do we get an image of this dust? And roughly the same time, I was using uh, a new camera aboard Hubble called the Advanced Camera for Surveys. And this is uh, the optical image I finally obtained. I achieved the, uh, the fidelity that, I re that was needed to see the dust disk. And here it is. The star is blocked by a chronograph. The, the dust is in this narrow belt, roughly 133 astronomical units from the star. In this image, I can't quite detect any planets. For example, this object here is a background star, and there's another background star there. But all of this other, all these other dots here are uh, noise, uh, artifacts of the observation and of the data analysis process. But there's something very interesting about this uh, image. If you look carefully, Trace the, trace the belt with your eye and try to figure out where the center of the belt is and compare it to the position of the star. So there's the belt. And this green circle is the center of the belt, but the position of the star is here. In fact, that offset is 15 astronomical units. The entire belt is shifted away from the star by 15 astronomical units. There are some interesting things here in these boxes. These are actually background galaxies. These are stars. So we don't detect anything that is a planet. But what we do see is a remarkable asymmetry in how the belt is oriented relative to the star. And this immediately brought up the idea that there's a, a perturbing object an object that is shifting the center of gravity, if you will, so that the belt is offset. And there was a theory developed by a, a collaborator, uh, Mark Wyatt, who's now at Cambridge. And he, uh, he called it pericenter glow. And the idea, if you want to find uh, this paper, it's in uh, Astrophysical Journal, published in 1999. He was trying to understand how uh, a dust disk can be offset in this manner. And essentially what the principle is, is if you have a planet which has some non-circular orbit, it has an eccentricity. The planet forces an ec its eccentricity on particles that are also orbiting the star. And in fact, you get a toroidal shape like this. The center of this to torus is here, C, and the star is actually offset from the center of this torus. 
So you have a perturbing object forcing eccentricities on this, uh, on these uh, many uh, uh, billions of particles. But there's one key question. Is it possible that the perturbing object is actually outside of the belt? How about another companion star? So it turns out in this, in this theory, you don't need a planetary system to produce this offset. You can have a companion star also on an elliptical orbit causing this entire offset. So it was not enough to say that this offset was due to a planetary system. We had to do something else, and that's we measured the edge of this belt along this direction. And essentially what we found is that it's consistent with a knife edge. This is a cut across the belt as a function of radius. You can see that the peak of the belt uh, is roughly at 140 astronomical units. Uh, this is just a cut of brightness. And this extremely sharp edge on the inside of the belt is consistent with a planet sculpting the inside of the belt. At the time, we compared it to models uh, uh, for our own Kuiper belt. People were interested in how Neptune sculpts the dust distribution in our Kuiper belt. And it turns out, if you have Neptune in these models, you have a very sharp edge to our Kuiper belt on the inside. And if you remove the planetary system, there is no edge. So we concluded that, in fact, there must be a planet uh, in, within Fomalhaut's dust belt. So with this motivation, we came back to Fomalhaut again in 2006. That discovery image was obtained in 2004. And because we had made the discovery, we were awarded more time. And we got this very uh, significantly deeper image of Fomalhaut's dust belt in the optical. This is 0.6 microns. Again, the, the star is blocked by the chronograph. Here's that background star here. Here's that other background star there, saturated. And that's why it's, uh, it's, been, uh, it's black in the middle. And lo and behold, there's another point source here. And that is that little speck is a world like Jupiter. Here it is in 2004. Now I'm zooming in to uh, that region where the planet is located. The, the images are registered. Uh, and here it is in 2006. So it moved in an orbit. It moves uh, by several AU over uh, uh, 1.8 years. This is a remarkable thing to see, actually. Uh, not only did we know it was co-moving with the star, a companion to the star, we also could see it orbiting the star. Here is what the orbit looks like when, when you orient the image so that north is up, east is left. This is, if you were to look at Fomalhaut in the sky, this is the orientation you would see uh, on, an alta, on a, uh, an irregular telescope, uh, Cassegrain telescope. It's a counterclockwise orbit. Here is Fomalhaut B, roughly 119 astronomical units from the star. So our own solar system uh, with Neptune's orbit would be contained in here. So Fomalhaut B is quite a ways out there, very near the dust belt. What is the mass of Fomalhaut B? We did this uh, analysis using two techniques. The first is understanding how close Fomalhaut B is to the edge of the dust belt. And this was the work done my, by my collaborator, Eugene Chang. In this model, we set up uh, uh, many thousands, tens of thousands of particles in a belt that is supposed to represent uh, Fomalhaut's dust belt. Actually, this represents the comets, not the dust. These are the parent bodies of dust. And we put a planet in there. And we can adjust the mass of the planet. We can make it heavier than Jupiter, lighter than Jupiter, and so on and so forth. But one thing we know is the distance Fomalhaut b is from the inner edge of the belt. So we observe this distance. We know it's 18 AU from the inner edge of the belt. And we, uh, we do this simulation using essentially gravity to see uh, what happens to the belt. The gravity of the star, of the planet, erodes the inner edge of the belt. And here we're going over many tens of thousands of years, integrating all of these particles. And essentially, uh, as if you increase the mass of the, belt, of the planet, the edge has to move farther out because the planet's gravitational influence is expanding as you increase the mass. Its elliptical orbit 
is responsible for this offset that we've talked about. Uh, so the planet has an eccentricity of roughly 0.1. Now we're going to go uh, further and we're going to model collisions so that these white things are the comets colliding with each other and they produce dust. The red particles are large dust grains uh, which have long lifetimes because they're not influenced by radiation pressure from the star. The purple the purple dots are very tiny dust grains which are immediately blown out by radiation pressure from Fomalhaut. Fomalhaut's an A star. It's 16 times more luminous than the sun. So now we're going to follow the dust because it's the dust that we observe. We don't observe the, co the parent bodies. We observe the dust and the planet. And so we propagate this uh, 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 simulation now with the dust. And essentially we show that we can reproduce what we see in the sky, uh, dust and planet. And the, the result is that we know uh, we have an upper limit to the mass of the planet. Uh, essentially this plots the result of our simulation here. The location of the dust belt is at 140 astronomical units. And if, for example, we assume a 10 Jupiter mass planet, here it is, the planet, it, has, it, must be lo it would be located farther away from the edge of the belt. It would be located at less than 100 astronomical units from Fomalhaut. And this is not what we observe. We don't observe uh, Fomalhaut B at this distance from the belt. Rather, we observe it from the, at this distance from the inner edge of the belt. And that corresponds to a Jupiter mass planet. And there are other things that we look at, like these edge profiles and so on and so forth. So the, the conclusion from our model here is that Fomalhaut b is unlikely to be as massive in, as 10 Jupiter masses. Rather, it's less than three Jupiter masses. Even a Neptune mass is possible. So this is how we estimate the mass of Fomalhaut b using dynamics. The more traditional way is to look at how much light is coming from Fomalhaut b. What does its spectrum look like? Now, we don't have an, a spectrum. We have uh, looked at Fomalhaut b at different wavelengths. Uh, here is uh, the optical, 0.6 microns, where we see some variability from 2004 to 2006. We detected it at 0.8 microns. And we also tried from Keck uh, to detect Fomalhaut b. These are upper limits because it wasn't detected at Keck. And also at Gemini at uh, 3.8 microns, uh, again, we have an upper limit. And also at a very short wavelength with the Hubble uh, where it was not detected. And plotted over this is a theoretical spectrum of a planet at that age, 200 million years. Actually, there are two theoretical spectra plotted. And this spectrum allows us to predict what the flux should be. So in the optical, Fomalhaut b, according to these spectra, should be this bright, but it's over an order of magnitude brighter in our observations. So we think that the optical detection uh, may be due to some physics that we haven't understood yet. Uh, we fit the model, the planet model, to the 0.8 micron flux. And this, this uh, predicts that it should have been detected in the near infrared at 1.6 microns. And we're using here a, a planet that has a temperature of 400 Kelvin with a mass between 1.7 and 3.5 and Jupiter masses. Now the problem is, why didn't we detect it here? But one thing you notice is that the models disagree. Here is the peak at 1.6 microns. Here is the peak of one model. And here is the peak of another model. So there's a factor of few discrepancy in our theoretical understanding of, of planets. So uh, we're not quite sure why we haven't detected it, except that perhaps the theoretical models have to be revised. Here is our, uh, Keck our uh, Gemini data uh, at 3.8 microns. Here is the star. Gemini, uh, we're actually at Gemini North on Mauna Kea. Here is uh, where Fomalhaut the star is. And this circle here is where Fomalhaut B should have been detected. So the models predict the detection, but we didn't see it. So what's your conclusion? Well, at least your question should be, is Fomalhaut B real? Here I am using Hubble. I, uh, I'm telling you that I've found something, but it hasn't been confirmed using another instrument or by another team. 
So what are some possibilities? Uh, is it possible you have two artifacts called speckles? Or is it possible that Fomalhaut B is a background star? Or is it possible, as suggested in this uh, cartoon, that uh, uh, people are thinking that maybe it's photoshopped? So uh, it's actually not photoshopped. I can uh, guarantee you that because my collaborators would kill me. But uh, I'll show you why I'm pretty sure it's not a speckle. Here is the focal plane of the instrument I used. And you can see it has these spots. So this is a CCD, just like in your digital camera or your cell phone. But it has two things in the way. And these things are meant to block light from the star. There's a large spot here and a smaller spot in the center. And I put Fomalhaut, the star, behind both of these spots. So I was alternating between the spots. And here are the images. Here you can see the star is behind the big spot here. And the star is now behind the middle spot here. In fact, there's a larger saturation column because the spot is smaller than that spot. And when you go back and forth and dither between these two spots, Fomalhaut B is consistently found at the right place. Whereas a speckle would have moved around and there would be no uh, convergence on this. Also, uh, Fomalhaut B is detected at two wavelengths and I processed the data two different ways. So I'm confident that Fomalhaut B is a real detection. Is it a background star? This is actually really easy to show because between 2004 and 2006, the background star moves in this direction by this magnitude, whereas this is the motion of Fomalhaut B to the same scale uh, and the same orientation. So this motion is completely different from that of what background stars appear to move. OK, so Fomalhaut B is real. Are we seeing a planet? Or maybe it's, is it something else that we're seeing? So in that, this plot of the spectrum, there's a blue line here. Remember, this black line is the emission spectrum of a theoretical planet at 200 million years of age. This blue line is a simulation of pure reflection, reflected light. Uh, so essentially, this represents the spectrum of Fomalhaut the star uh, seen in reflection from a planet. So is it possible you have a ring of material around Fomalhaut B that is producing this anomalously bright optical flux? Is that possible? Perhaps it's a proto-Galilean circumplanetary disk. Well, let's take a look at some of the numbers here. How much flux does Fomalhaut B receive from the star? And that's easy to calculate because I told you it's 115 astronomical units from the star. That's D here. The luminosity of Fomalhaut is known uh, fairly well. So you get 1.7 watts per meter squared. What is this? What planet in our solar system gets this flux? Pardon? Neptune. Neptune, that's right. That's right. Equivalent to the flux received from Neptune. Remember, Fomalhaut B is roughly at 120 astronomical units from the star. But the star is 16 times brighter. In other words, Fomalhaut B is four times farther than Neptune. But the star Fomalhaut is 16 times brighter than the sun. So these numbers uh, cancel out. So if you're sitting on Fomalhaut B, it's essentially like observing the sun from Neptune. So it's not that strange of a planet if you think of it in, this terms, in these terms. How much flux uh, from Fomalhaut B do we receive if we have a pure reflection? So now this D is the heliocentric distance of Fomalhaut from the sun. And you put this 1.7 watts per meter squared. But now you have to assume what exactly is reflecting light from Fomalhaut B. What is the area of the mirror, essentially? And how efficient is this mirror? What we observe is a visual magnitude of 25th magnitude. If you have a planet only, assuming a, a 1.2 Jupiter radii and a scattering efficiency of 50%, that bare planet would appear to be a 30th magnitude object. So this is too faint. So we're positive that what we observe is not reflected light from a planet alone. How about if we start adding rings to the planet? 
Well, it turns out we can match the observations if we uh, have a ring system that has uh, 20 planetary radii, if you assume a scattering efficiency of 40%. Or if you make the rings darker, you just have to increase the surface area of the, of the rings to account for the light we see. So we have 35 planetary radii. Is it realistic to have a ring system that's 35 planetary radii? Well, uh, Callisto is located at 27 Jupiter radii. So Callisto formed out of something, uh, a, 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 circumplanet a circumplanetary disk. So it's possible, indeed, that what we're seeing is a proto-Galilean circumplanetary disk. So instead of that nice ring system uh, in that previous illustration, it's really a, a, a massive uh, uh, ring system around Fomalhaut b uh, that perhaps is in the process of forming Galilean satellites. And of course, there are problems. Fomalhaut b is 200 million years of age. Uh, if you look at uh, models of how fast Callisto forms, uh, uh, circum, uh, circumplanetary uh, Galilean satellites form on uh, on order of a million years. So it's not clear why this circumplanetary disk would still exist if it's actually busy forming Galilean satellites. There might be other explanations. For example, does Fomalhaut b have excursions into the dust belt? If it has an excursion into the dust belt, maybe it accretes more material uh, in its circumplanetary environment and therefore maintains this, uh, this belt, which we see today. Here's another question. Is this the first direct detection or picture of an exosolar planet? And uh, in fact, this is a, essentially a new age uh, uh, where we are beginning to look at planets directly using direct images. Here is the list uh, I've put together so far, uh, and it's arranged by heliocentric distance. These are the names of the stars. Fomalhaut has, is at the top because it's the closest star with a directly detected planet at uh, 25 light years. Beta Pic is uh, actually next in line. 8799 has uh, three planetary mass objects. That's very interesting. Um, and if you look at the ages, these are all relatively young systems, not like the solar system, uh, not giga year ages, but essentially analogs to our young solar system. Fomalhaut b is also stands out as having the lowest mass. So some of these objects could be brown dwarfs if you look at these masses in terms of Jupiter masses. Uh, but Fomalhaut b is probably the lowest mass. Five years from now, uh, we'll have instruments such as Gemini Planet Imager and Sphere, which will uh, go on Keck Telescope and the Very Large Telescope in Chile, uh, and I'm sorry, Gemini Telescope and the VLT in Chile. And this list should have 100 rows. So uh, the, the future is promising. One of the objects that has uh, uh, not been confirmed is Beta Pic B. And this was the discovery image made last year, uh, uh, published by Lagrange et al. in 2009. Here is this uh, point source next to Beta Pic, which is also now blocked. So you don't see light from the star, you just see emission from this source. It's eight astronomical units from the star, which is very enticing because now it's more or less a Jupiter analog uh, rather than a Neptune analog. Uh, and we observed it last December, and the problem is we didn't detect it. Here is where Beta Pic B should have been located. Here we're using the Keck adaptive <laughs> optic system, and this paper is coming out soon. So one possibility, which is very interesting, is that at 8 AU, the, orbit, the orbital motion of Fomalhaut b has brought the, the planet closer to the star as seen projected on the sky. So that if we wait a little longer, maybe this year or maybe next, we'll see Fomalhaut b pop out on the other side. So that remains to be seen. Uh, and we have some Keck time to continue, uh, continue this experiment. So uh, let me just summarize uh, what was achieved here. We have the first optical detection of an exoplanet orbiting another star. I just want to uh, emphasize that all of these other uh, uh, dis discoveries or candidates are detected in the infrared. 
an optical detection is important because uh, as a planet ages, its infrared emission decreases. So you want to have the ability to look at these planets in the optical when you're past a giga year of age. Um, the star is close by, 25 light years away. It's between a Neptune and a Jupiter mass. Formal hot B's mass will be constrained in the future, but it cannot be a brown dwarf. It's a definite planet mass candidate. This is the first time uh, since 1846 that we've had a new planet detected by optical imaging. But it's too bright in the optical, and this is a mystery. And this could be due to a uh, planetary ring system. Now, there are many groups that are uh, looking at Fomalhaut now extremely closely, uh, hot off the press. Uh, Matt Kenworthy in Arizona uh, using the MMT, another large telescope, at five microns. He, he, here is where Fomalhaut B is located, and here is his field. And he detects no uh, planets greater than two Jupiter masses between 30, 13 and 40 astronomical units. There's also a result for, from Spitzer. Uh, where they don't find any massive planets. So it seems like Fomalhaut B, Fomalhaut, if it has more planets around it, they're probably a Jupiter mass or less. Uh, and we need to improve our observations to detect uh, these less massive planets. And another VLT result that shows that the, the spin of the star is also counterclockwise. So that, that is consistent with our finding. So what are we doing in the future? Uh, we have two epochs of observation of Fomalhaut b. So the orbit could be a straight line, right? If you have two points, it's a straight line. So <laughs> we need this third and fourth epochs, epoch to see the curvature of the orbit to really get an orbit. Uh, uh, and uh, we hope to be able to do that uh, in November. I'm using the Whitefield Camera 3 that was just installed by the astronauts on Hubble. I'm using a WIFC 3 near th uh, around Thanksgiving to get this third epoch. But why not be more ambitious? What else can we do? Can we send a spacecraft to Fomalhaut? Yeah, it's possible, I guess. Uh, but uh, if you look at where Voyager 1 is, it still has a long way to go, right? Uh, Voyager 1 is uh, traveling now at 60,000 miles an hour, 60,000 miles an hour, and it's still going to take 40,000 years to get to the nearest star. So we can't, we can't use uh, Voyager or spacecraft just yet to uh, look at Fomalhaut. But we can use techniques from the ground. So this is my vision for Fomalhaut. Uh, over the next uh, five or six years, I think we'll be able to see asteroid belts around Fomalhaut. These gaps between the belts will indicate if Fomalhaut B is alone or if, in fact, there's Fomalhaut C, D, and E. We should be able to resolve uh, the zodiacal light now. So this is closer to the habit habitable zone around Fomalhaut which is roughly one arc second away from the star. So we may even have indications of terrestrial mass planets in the near future. One thing I think is important is that because Fomalhaut is um, just the right orientation, just the right distance from our sun, just, uh, just the right age, so planets are still glowing, I think that Fomalhaut may be one of these stars where we can gather the most detail about its planetary system. In other words, we're going to be seeing, like with Kepler, thousands of, we're, we're going to be detecting thousands of planets around thousands of stars. But Fomalhaut may be one of those planetary systems where we know of every planet that orbits the star, uh, including the terrestrial mass planets. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Ron. I'll... I'll uh take my privilege of asking the first question. Uh, you showed with the beta pic uh, orientation, it looks like one of the planets is about to cross in front. Can our, our uh, occultation measurements possible for this uh, as it passes across? Yes. Uh, so uh, remember, beta pic was shown at the beginning of the talk and has an edge-on disk. 
So this planet, uh, instead of going around in a circle, which would be the face-on orientation, it, from our perspective, is just going to be going back and forth in its orbit. And it's possible, uh, and there's an extremely small chance, that you would detect an occultation. Uh, because mainly, if the, at eight astronomical units, if this orbital plane has the tiniest uh, inclination away from edge on, you would not see it pass in front of the photosphere. But if you had terrestrial planets uh, closer in, you would see occultation events. There is a report of occultation event on Vitapik observed in 2000. Yes, there, so uh, uh, the comment is there is an uh, occultation event observed uh, back in 1981, uh, but it's a mysterious event. There's uh, over several days, there's a brightening of Beta Pic's light curve with over in five filters. So it's not just one filter <coughs> that this is seen. So it's confirmed that there's a brightening of the light and then a dip. And uh, the current understanding is that it's material in Beta Pic's dust belt that uh, is essentially causing this anomalous brightening and dimming. Uh, so it's not quite the type of light curve you'd expect for an Earth-like planet uh, passing in front of the star. <clears throat> that magnitude that you quoted for the planet, uh, that's an I? Is that an I magnitude? Or? So I, I quoted some uh, magnitudes for the planet uh, Fomalhaut B, right? Uh, uh, and it's a V magnitude. Oh, V magnitude. Uh, point, okay. It's at 0. 0.6 microns, roughly. Okay, because I was wondering, um, that's going to be very hard to take a spectrum of... Uh, it's uh, uh, we've <laughs> Yes, is it going to be hard to get a spectrum? And the answer is yes. Uh, hard in the sense that, for example, if I were to use the Keck 10 meter telescope, I would need to request something like 20 nights of time, which I would never get. Uh, I think our only hope uh, is Hubble uh, over the next few years. Uh, Hubble has a spectrograph called the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, the STIS instrument. So STIS uh, uh, and something we're working with uh, with the director of Space Telescope Science Institute to see if we could get this spectrum. So, any luck to get uh, when you see when you show your spectra uh, invisible in the infrared, you need, you have uh, you notice that there is no detection in the near infrared. Um, Will it be possible to detect, uh, to detect the planet with the new instrument like Nikki or GPI or Sphere? What kind of gain you, you, you are going to get compared to Keck, for instance? So the question is, uh, there are these future instruments, uh, uh, Gemini Planet Imager, GPI, Sphere. Will we be able to detect, use their enhanced capability to detect planets to look at Fomalhaut B? And it turns out, for another reason, we won't be able to use uh, GPI and Sphere, and that's because Fomalhaut B is too far away from the star. Uh, uh, it's over here, whereas the field of view of these other instruments will be very narrow. It's not bad. I mean, this is where uh, Jupiter-like analogs will reside uh, at 10 astronomical units from the star. So we'll be look. We'll, with GPI and Sphere, we won't get further information about Fomalhaut B, but we'll be looking at Fomalhaut C, D, E, and F. I hope. <laughs> and maybe Fomalhaut G. <laughs> Paul, with your um, detection image, uh, the coronagraphs seem to smear. Um, can you say why it makes that shape? So here's the detection image. Yeah, why is the coronagraph dark? Spot, not a spot, but it's smeared and it looks like it has two. So the so here there are black areas not only because uh, we're using a chronograph, but certain other parts of the CCD are saturated with light. So these are called saturation columns uh, right here, and then there's a hint of the other chronographic spot here, and there's also a chronographic bar in the way. Um, 
So what you're seeing here are many images stitched together. In fact, the whole telescope is being rotated around the star. So if you look at the edge here, it's jagged because I'm rotating this square field around the star, which is a technique we use to detect planets. It was actually invented by Bernard Leo when he was looking at the sun. And uh, let me just remind you of what these, what these things are. Here is the focal plane again. So here is that occulting bar here, a three arc second occulting spot here, and a 1.8 occulting spot there. So I'm combining all of these images to show you that one image. So you're seeing artifacts of these structures. I, uh, considering your introduction with the Greek philosophers, it is, um, it, it, it should be mentioned that uh, 500 years ago, you would have been burned at the stake for that. Uh, and uh, I'm not being fastidious, Giordano Bruno was uh, with the, uh, and to show mercy, a uh, bag of gunpowder was placed around his neck. Ah. Uh, <clears throat> that was a thousand year, nearly a thousand years after the Greek philosophers, Epicurus and others in your introduction had uh, speculated. He, did, he didn't do anything more. Uh, this is important to remember in this day and age when there is a war on science by certain political parties. Yes, there's always a tension between uh, scientists and what they think is out there and other people who believe there are other things out there. That's right. Okay, there are no further questions. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking Paul for his great support. Thank you.